Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third series of the Land Africa Talks. I'm your moderator, Chris Emesway. Today's speakers are Isaac Manzi and Kilia, who will share their journey and insights in developing Kenya Wonder language technologies with Fair Forward and other open source communities. These are world class experts in their fields. Um, Isaac Manzi is an NLP enthusiast working closely with the global project called Fair Forward Artificial Intelligence for All. And they're working towards an open and sustainable development and application of AI in Rwanda. Um, Kilia Mugenzi also works with Fair Forward and she, along with working towards building technologies for the Kenya Rwanda language, she has years of experience in program management and technology and various AI applications. Um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chris, for a great introduction. Um, probably as I can share the screen, then we can later kick off. Uh, we're so excited to be here and so excited to speak about what we do in uh, Rwanda, especially with the Kenya Rwanda language, um, and looking forward to inspire more discussions around that, and also uh, looking forward for engagement that could lead to potential synergies on how we can create uh, more of these um, good things. Um, so Isaac, if you can probably share a screen. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, my name is Isaac Manzi. Uh, I work uh, with the AI Hub Rwanda as a data innovation advisor, working closely with Fair Forward uh, on how to scale NLP applications uh, for Kenya Rwanda and how do we make data and other benchmark models and data sets accessible uh, to, the, to the whole community. Thank you. All right, so I think you can go to the next slide where I can make introductions a bit more about Fair Forward. Um, the Fair Forward is a German initiative um, program which is implemented on the behalf of the German um, Federation Ministry of Economy and Cooperation and Development, which is BMZ, and it is currently being implemented by um, GIZ. And the main goal here is to democratize um, AI worldwide by fostering the local innovation towards open AI. And with the three action areas that we actually work with include um, improve access to training data and AI technologies for local open innovation. And then the next one is um, we strengthen the local technical know-how um, in around the AI topics in Africa and Asia. And then the last um, action area that we focus in is of course to develop um, policy frameworks um, for readiness of AI ethical and also um, data protection and privacy. So we do have activities around all of the three action areas that we speak. Um, within the first one, which is improve access to training data and AI technologies for local open innovation, we have work around the natural language processing and also uh, machine learning for asset innovation with keen interest in low risk of languages and also um, climate change. Um, for the second one, which is strengthen um, the local technical know-how on AI in Africa and Asia, we've supported different capacity building programs um, that actually um, help the local community to actually um, have the knowledge around AI and also different AI topics in order to foster uh, their interest in actually venturing into the AI field. And then the last part, which is the, the develop policy frameworks. Uh, we've actually championed these by creating different um, national air policies um, in different countries. Uh, we've seen um, different work around also creating um, a triple A permanent, which is uh, the Africa Asia uh, Policy Network, which is easier uh, for policies for policymakers uh, from different countries to share, uh, and also uh, have discussion around you know what could easily foster the open good use of AI. But also our keen interest is with the use of a of uh, ethical AI because we think that if AI is applied in the right way. It could actually um, contribute a lot to the innovation, and you know, contribute also to the to the good use, and also with the key interest of the people at heart. And uh, also, one of the things that we have championed into that area is actually creating the ethical guidelines for for different countries um, in terms of like to help them also foster discussions around um, data protection and privacy. So right now we are for the duration of time that we've been operating is since. 2019 to 2025, and our main partners in this journey um, include Smart Africa, Mozilla, IDRS, and also UNDP. Maybe we can go to the next slide where 
now we'll talk about more of the access to training data and AI technologies. Um, so maybe just giving you guys brief, you know, brief just um rundown of activities that we have already done, which can be um, counted towards the achievements that we've done. Uh, there's the launch of member of the Global Open Good Open for Good Alliance to promote the localized aid training data in Africa and Asia and beyond, because um, as you know, uh, in order to develop any application, you need a lot of data and we still find um, the lack of data as one of the, like, the pillar of the problems that we have as, as a community. So one of the things that we actually did is uh, launch this, um, uh, launch the member of the Global Open for Good Alliance to promote then uh, the localized um, air training data. Uh, the next thing that we're supporting so far is also the Lacuna Fund, which open calls to create um, locally relevant open data sets in NLP, in agriculture, and also um, call on inclusive, you know, climate data. As much as we want to solve uh, the problems that we have uh, with the local subsidies, then this is the best approach because we have low resource languages. Uh, we have agriculture, which is like one of the biggest topics to talk about here in Africa. And also we have the climate data, which can actually contribute um, to the change of uh, climate, which is, has been, you know, hazard from left and right. And the next thing that we, we are looking forward to is we're looking for different solutions that um, can actually contribute to the readiness of, you know, the African continent towards uh, climate response. We also have um, the National Language Processing where we would like to champion uh, the introduction of AI to low research languages and also um, champion the use of AI also in agriculture per se. Um, one of the main activities actually that led us to having this discussion is also, can we, can we go back a bit Just on the first slide? Yes. So one of the activities that we actually had which leads to this discussion of course is the uh, open um, voice technologies um, through uh, new speech data sets uh, which we have already worked on with Mozilla, which includes Kinyarwanda, Kiswahili, and Luganda, um, as well as, you know, other six languages, in Indian languages, because we also work in India, we've actually been able to create speech models uh, to be able to foster um, the introduction of NLP uh, in those um, localized languages. So you will get to hear more about the activities that we've done in Rwanda with Isaac, where he do some more of like a simple technical rundown of what has already been done and what is the next being done. So just um, um, just doing another quick uh, rundown of activities that we've done so far. Uh, we have the Baza COVID-19 chatbot, which has over 500,000 um, users here in Rwanda. We've uh, actually launched a last slide monitoring um, system here in Rwanda in the areas of machine learning for activation. There's also things we've created with other in other countries, which includes uh, the analysis tool for optimal uh, rural electrification sources in Uganda. We also have a smartphone app for coffee yield um, prediction in Uganda. We also have an early warning um, system for climate smart agriculture in Kenya, and also we're championing um, a chatbot development for business registration in Kenya. So these are different activities that we have around um, the continental, the regional area, but we also have, we are starting to work with also Indonesia, and also we have already done some work in um, Ghana and and India. Yeah. So I think you can go to the next slide. Yes, so as probably just a background, as I was saying before, in order to develop any application, really we need data. And different local stakeholders um, have repeatedly identified the lack of training data as a problem. And this problem actually intensifies uh, when programmers fall back on the global data set because they do not represent the local context. As much as I would want to develop um, any AI application that could run fully in Kinyarwanda, there's still lack of data, there's still lack of um, access to these models that actually are built for the local context. So. This actually leads to a poor result, and hence to the need to actually have the local AI innovation based on local data, hence the need uh, from the community, hence the need from different stakeholders that we work with. So the first three areas that we approached with to solve this problem, the first one is to making voice recognition accessible for all. 
by building more of a Pan-African and international cooperation between key players in the NLP and the ecosystem in private sector and academia. We've championed this by working with different um, researchers, um, specifically in academia, to actually help us foster discussions around the NLP. Uh, we had different linguistics, different data sciences that actually um, championed the talk around um, NLP in these particular areas. And also the private sector in terms of like uh, who implements this and who um, now works towards the open AI um, concept, concept for it. So the next thing then is the scaling AI innovation for public interest through startups. So the accelerator views an existing effort um, of GIS that specifically supports tech entrepreneurs here in Rwanda. And the goal here is actually to promote the local innovators in building um, data sets and applications that fit the specific context of saying um, it's going to work in Rwanda, it's going to work in Kenya, or it's going to work in Rwanda. And then the last part, which I'm going to talk about, is the open AI for sustainable agriculture to combat climate change. Um, this is specifically in the areas of machine learning for asset innovation, where it's really important to build training data set and practical models uh, for using machine learning um, in the areas of earth innovation. It's really important to, when you speak about climate readiness, when you speak about agriculture, it's good that we develop these models that are actually um, trained by the local data in order to respond um, to the data that you said. So I think you can go to the next slide and I show you a bit more of the partners that we've worked with and different initiatives that we have so far. Um, just go next. Maybe we can do next. Yeah, so we have Mozilla that we've already talked about that we've worked with um, towards the uh, the creation of data sets um, and also speech models uh, in Kinyarwanda, Kiswahili, and Uganda. We have the Lacuna Fund that is going to champion the training data set. And we also have Zindi that are, we actually work with them towards the different hackathons that also uh, foster the growth of actually the discussions around the NLP. So the next thing, which was scaling AI innovation for public interest um, through startups, uh, we already had the Africa AI Accelerator, and we're also looking forward to actually have a more of a global activity, which is the modular AI support um, program, which is actually towards um, supporting different startups that actually implement our work with open AI in terms of like, how can we, how can we make money at the end of the day um, using open AI? and also different open models. So I'm gonna close a bit by giving you a snippet of what has already been done um, in Kinyarwanda through Fair Forward. And then I'm gonna hand over the floor to Isaac to now take us through um, different um, technical and also different things that have been done in Kinyarwanda specifically. So uh, with the expansion of the voice data collection with Mozilla and development of AI use cases after collecting high and quality data set in Kinyarwanda and making openly available and common voice platforms. Now the next question was like, what can we do with it? What um, can we actually derive from having this, you know, data set in Kinyarwanda? So hence the development of the Baza chatbot, the COVID-19 Baza chatbot, which has been successful so far in, in Rwanda. And this has helped us actually uh, pinpoint the development of the SDG relevant um, use cases based on the interaction model that this could be one of the ways that you know having a localized um, data set can actually contribute to creating um, meaningful use cases that can actually work in the run in the in the country specific context so uh, maybe you can read more about that on the mozilla page and happy to have had this discussion with you as i hand over to my colleague isaac to now go forward uh to different other um, topics thank you very much Thank you, Kelly, for that uh, introduction on, uh, on the global initiative that is Fair Forward. And so uh, going forward, so as you hear what we're, sp what we're speaking about and uh, being a language technology evangelist and all that, the question becomes, why? Why do we do this? What is the motivation, right? As, as anybody would think. Why be invested in this? Why is it important that uh, Alexa or Siri or all these other voice assistants do not just stop at English or French or Spanish or such. And so <clears throat> I would like to draw your attention to this uh, graph uh, from uh, 
from a research paper on language resource distribution. And so what we see here is that a lot of languages uh, have a lot of speakers, but they do not have uh, labeled data. So uh, reading, reading the caption here, language resource distribution, the size and color of a circle represent the number of languages and speakers respectively in each category. And so what we see here is that a lot of languages are in the in the nice range of of one or zero, or sorry, or five or four. And so this is English, this is French, perhaps German, uh, Spanish, and other high resource languages, Mandarin. But we have a lot of languages in the zero to one to two band, and even three, where we have a lot of speakers uh, globally, but we do not have labeled data. And so what is this, this limitation? Uh, what does it incur? Is that we cannot develop anything for these languages. We cannot develop any voice assistance. We cannot develop um, machine translation. We cannot develop even on a basis, even on a small scale. We cannot, we do not have spell checkers and uh, text prediction algorithms for these kind of languages. And that is limited because we have not annotated the data. We have not collected the data for these languages. So in the future, as we scale to voice assistance and other conversation AI, if we do not work on this uh, fundamental, on this foundational uh, aspect, component of creating the labor data and such, then we cannot, we cannot build, we cannot catch up to the technologies that are being developed for other high resource languages. And so looking at this band of green, indigo and blue, is what we could call low resource languages. And this is where we lie. And so why is this important? Again, coming back, this isn't a multiple scale. It is not just about, we need to catch up with uh, voice assistance and such. No, it's, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional, it's a multi-faceted aspect. It's a multi-faceted uh, question. It's a multi-faceted demand. It's, we're working on a societal need. We're working on linguistic requirements. We're working on machine learning requirements. And we're working on a culture, normative, and also cognitive requirements. And so I hope I did not bore you here, but I'd like to walk you through each why this is important. And so on a societal perspective, we cannot create technology that is only accessible for English. When web, web 1.0, web 2.0 released is we have a plethora, we have abundant resources in English. And so if you have to access the web, you have to have an understanding of English or other uh, technological resources like this. But this limits people from our communities. This limits people who perhaps do not understand English. And so it's important to make information accessible in other languages. It's important that Wikipedia should be accessible in other things. It's important that you can type a search in Google and it can give you back the same search results accurately to some extent as it can in English, as you can for Kinyarwanda or Swahili or Hausa or such. And so these are languages that have a huge number of speakers. And so we have to annotate the data, we have to create open resources to enable engineers and other developers to work on this. And so in that sense, we are bridging the divide gap, uh, digital divide gap uh, closer. And <clears throat> onto the second point is why is this important from a linguistic perspective? And so I will come back to this uh, in my last slide, but uh, natural language processing is not only a technical uh, endeavor, is, it is also a linguistic endeavor in the sense of we need uh, efforts and we need support from all these different facets. And so as, as much as I've talked about society, so you might understand that uh, somebody in sociology, somebody that understands how the technologies affect our population, how the technologies affect the communities, where they're implemented, it is important that these people are also crucial there are also key elements in, in uh, helping to develop and build these applications. And so onto the linguistic perspective is that we understand language 
we've been training computers to understand language from an English perspective. These are resource-rich languages that belong to the Indo-European language family, but the morphology is poor. And so looking at, looking at recent research papers uh, for Kinyarwanda, for such, is we have morphologically rich languages and we have not made an endeavor to understand their linguistical components. And so this is coming down to a really, not only uh, both at the word level and at a sentence level. The way we encode information in Kinyarwanda is different from the way we encode information in, uh, in English. And so we have to also put in uh, the work to understand this from a linguistic perspective is why do we write like this? Why is there agglutination in Kinyarwanda? Why are words concatenated? Why are words not? What is the semantic and syntax preserved or that gets lost when we transfer this information to English? So that is uh, from a linguistic perspective. From the machine learning perspective is understanding that as an NLP engineer, as you may be uh, in this call, we encode a lot of our assumptions into these models that we build, but we need to under, we cannot encode only assumptions for English. We need to also encode assumptions for our language and, and other biases that are not only specific to English. So if we were training on a data set that is, uh, sorry, that, uh, uh, that is a data set on English, there are biases that will be passed on to the model because this is how English speakers speak or French or Spanish or whatever. And so maybe these biases are not inherent in Kinyarwanda and neither maybe not in uh, Swahili, maybe not in uh, Shona and such. And so we need to have uh, a perspective uh, from different areas, looking at all languages and thinking, what is inherent in this? Why are we doing this? And uh, how does this language, how are we encoding information and what biases do we carry over? What assumptions am I influencing? And so, and so coming to the culture and normative perspective is that it all, this also sheds light, uh, this as a segue, this also sheds light on our prejudices or conceptions in our local culture. And so what we might say in English or how we might train a computer to understand English does not carry over in Kinyarwanda. And so if we bring those models or those data sets locally here, they might fail to work in a production environment where they're being accessible to millions, a ton of people. And so we need to have language technologies that are consistent ac across various cultures. And so the, this is also important. And so from the cognitive perspective as well, is that look at, looking at uh, human development from a start, we understand languages a lot. We have uh, an ability to develop an understanding of languages from an earlier stage when we're children or such. And so even the models we build need to have this consistency. They should be able to learn abstractions that are not specific to any language, but that we can generalize different properties of what we're speaking about. And so coming closer into a focus about why do we need low resource language processing? So Kinyarwanda is spoken by nearly uh, 20 million people. 13 million people residing in Rwanda, and perhaps the other majority uh, in the other uh, remainder in other places of the, of the world and such. And so this inhibits us. If we cannot make conversation AI, machine translation, uh, or speech recognition or speech generation models that these people can access, that they can use, and so considering also the fact that our languages are very uh, verbal, we have a verbal culture, we communicate verbal. We do not have a history of writing. We have a history of telling stories. We speak. 
And so also the mo also the land, also the technologies we're developing need to be able to accommodate for this. And so coming a bit focused into the specific numbers. With the Mozilla Common Voice uh, platform, uh, two years ago in uh, 2019, there was the undertaking by the Digital Maganda uh, in partnership with uh, Mozilla and Fairford to collect over 2,000 hours of voice data. And so currently, I think 2,300 hours of this has been collected. 2,000 is validated. Of course, there has been uh, error analysis from different communities and other research groups, such as NVIDIA, uh, or such, but having this abundant resource, an open resource that is not uh, paywalled or such, uh, gives us the opportunity to, to work on this data. How, what can we learn from this? What technologies can we build from this? And so also on the, speaking, coming back to the point of the linguistic homogeneity is that we see in many other countries that the general populace has maybe say five to six languages. And so those could be dialects. But looking here in Rwanda, we all speak Kenya Rwanda. Perhaps uh, different variations of it slightly going into the uh, provincial areas and the, sub and the rural areas and such. But contrary to other countries such as Kenya, where there's more than 10 languages as Pachwa or Nigeria, or South Africa or such, we have this homogeneity of we all speak one language. So it, it would be very easy to scale this, to work on this, is that we could, it can uh, put in production. This would not need a lot of fine tuning or a lot or adjustment to become something that serves the entire populace. And so how do we approach this? Looking uh, from perspective of working in a development corporation, from perspective of working as an engineer or as a linguist, is what can we do is to build and share open data sets. That is the first thing. And so we have the Mozilla Common Voice, and people have taken up this uh, initiative, this endeavor to work on ASR or uh, uh, auto, uh, automated speech recognition for different, for Kenya Rwanda, because this is there. We've made this available. And it just doesn't stop there. We could be a learning point for other, for other languages, for other Bantu languages. And I speak on this because also there's a lot that is replicable. And there's a lot of what we're doing currently right now that has also, you know, that is taken from uh, research papers such as uh, Masakane's participatory approach is how do we engage and how do we mobilize the entire community? Not just looking at the linguistic perspective, not just machine learning. No, it just doesn't stop there. But how can we engage other people into developing these technologies? And so what can be done in one language, we can learn from this and transfer to other languages. And so with this endeavor, we hope that also what we're doing here can create a roadmap for other languages in our imminent uh, vicinity with our neighbors, perhaps for Swahili. Perhaps we could be working with that and seeing how to uh, co-develop uh, simultaneously uh, the language technologies for, this, for such uh, languages that fall under the same family, under the same uh, linguistic uh, family. And so this is, this is the, how do we get there? And so, but why is it important? Is that we can, through this, through creating voice technologies or text prediction models or such, we can extend our language to marginalized rural communities. We can, be a, we can be able to build applications or build interfaces that enable people to access information that previously they were not, they were inhibited they were restricted to access because it was only maybe accessible to English. And so this is under the leave no one behind principle. 
And so, as my colleagues spoke about, what has been done in Kenya NLP, what has been done in Kenya Rwanda natural language processing. As, as of last year, uh, as of two years ago, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and such, this brought uh, a need, this brought a call for, uh, this brought a requirement of how do people get the most updated and the most, in the most quickest fashion. And so this was done through a USSD chatbot. And so you may wonder, why USSD? And so while we think about creating uh, technologies uh, for low resource communities or low resource settings, is we also have to think about the hardware support or how do, these, how do we enable the most people to access what we're doing? So looking at, the, looking at statistics such as smartphone penetration or feature phone use, is that you would, you would realize that the optimal number to come down to is the optimal deployment method is USSD. And also this applies to the models we build that we have to think about what is our memory usage? <laughs> How can we deploy? Can this be supported on just a CPU or do we need large GPUs to run this? Because we're working in low resource community, so you ha we, have, we have an obligation to consider how to create these technologies that can be accessible to a lot of people. And so looking at the statistics here, I think uh, my colleague uh, spoke briefly about these numbers, but this was 15 million requests and 876,000 unique users. And on a daily basis, this was going to 20,000 unique users on a daily basis, people paying for this information. But it just doesn't stop there. And there's also, there's always the extension of what is next. How can we put this in a technologically uh, updated manner? And so I think, I think, I think maybe if a few, uh, Participants in this in this call are familiar with the Rasa uh, chatbot framework. Is this is how this was implemented, and it was a simple uh, semantic and a rule based uh, answering uh, platform where you could uh, write questions about COVID, and you could get precise answers about statistics about perhaps testing sites and or other relevant information. And this has potential to be scaled into other health applications. And what, what, is, the under, what is the underlying tech stack or the data sets that are supporting this? And so, as I said, as I mentioned, there's over 2,000 hours of Kenya Rwanda voice data. There's, uh, this is the second biggest and common voice. I think we just come under uh, English. And so I think, I think maybe uh, this might be a bit uh, obscuring the presentation, but there's also 17 hours of studio speech recorded uh, studio data, currently trend with over 4,000 steps. And so where are we and where do we want to go? There's a, we have a speech recognition API that we love to call people out to try and We've had hackathons regarding this, maybe back in uh, Feb, and we see different we see different undertakings, we see different innovative ideas of where can this be applied, such as in legal matters or or other human or, or supporting humanitarian aid. But we have the constraint of language modeling, and where do we see this uh, pop up? Where do we see this manifest once we deploy the model? is 
the word error rate is a bit high, but we're working to decrease that. And so currently the, the word error rate is 39. Uh, in this presentation, we have also added a link to our Hugging Face uh, page. And there's a space to test out the to test out the model, and so you can see how this works. And so, other researchers, other communities have been able to come close to this goal of less than 15 word error rate of the speech transcription. And so, this is built on the Koki model, but perhaps there's uh, there's promise in working with different models in retraining, perhaps in uh, collecting other data or cleaning the data that is already on the Mozilla common place. And so different communities, such as uh, NVIDIA's NEMO toolkit, or what SpeechBrain has done, is they're closer to this weather than we are. So as somebody who could be an enthusiast or an aficionado in, uh, in natural language processing, these are promising avenues or channels to look at and say, what can I learn from this and apply back to be able to create something that is of accurate, of accurate uh, performance? And with regard, and so this is about the speech recognition, the ASR. So with regards to the TTS, text to speech, is the mean opinion score is currently at three, and this is a one to five scale. So this is also medium, is uh, it's an average score is that this is not ready for production. But as we endeavor into building this, there's always different constraints and such. And so there's always the call to action from other people who are interested or different groups or such that collect data or that do annotation. And how can we optimize this to be able to say that at the end, we can have something that works precisely 100%. And so on the, on the good note, <laughs> maybe looking a bit far from the, living along the, uh, the error rates and such, but also these models are lightweight. And so the inference time is something in, uh, in, a, bunch, in, in a few seconds. And so we also have to consider this is, what is the computation? Can this be deployed on a smartphone or do you need to run it on GPUs and such? And, and so wrapping up on what has been done with the COVID-19 chatbot, with the uh, speech to text and the text to speech is now it's important to think about what is in the future for us? What can we do? What are we doing? And so it is, it is, our, uh, it is our opinion that this, uh, such emergent technologies can be sustained in an open source manner. And such, is the, and such is the mission and standard of the Fair Forward Global Initiative is that how how do you sustain this after production, after you get people to be alone it and everything? Where does it stay? And so open source. And I see a few members in this chat that I know from the Mbaza NLP community. And as I said, you can try our Hugging Face uh, page here. And so we do different undertakings. It's not enough to just create these models and let them lie somewhere. We can train people, we can teach people about this technology, about the tech stack, so that in a few years to come, they can either maintain the technologies that are deployed or they can think about new innovative ways about how to put this in production settings in different sectors. So we're, so previously the chatbot success was in health, but perhaps there's a promise for finance, for legal matters or such. And so that is one way and so, Everything that is open source and community driven is being held by Rambaza and Apple community, which I would love if you are not a member in this chat to join. 
we shall gladly be sending the link. And so that is one. And so the second thing is parallel data sets for neural machine translation is how, how can we create new data sets that people can use? And so lo lo looking at the looking at the current looking at the current or the previous uh, resources that were available for, if you wanted to get a sentence pair uh, data set, it was the JW300. But we can't, we can't just stop them. We have to create more data, especially if the data we have already, so for example, the JW300, that is skewed into a bit of uh, religious and a bit of kind of these uh, domains is, but can we create more data sets for other domains? How can we create more domain specific data? And it's through this, it's through uh, the community that we work on things like this. And the third thing is multilingual speech data collection is how can we collect, looking, looking at our communities, looking at us as, uh, as the African community is we have an untapped resource of multilingual speakers. On average, anyone, maybe perhaps in Rwanda or perhaps in any country you might go for, speaks at least two languages. So how can we engage with these people to create speech data? That, does just, that is not only just limited to one language, but multiple languages. How can we create, how can we get one speaker to, you know, to record? And where can this go? What can we use it for? And so this is also something to consider. And so coming to our close, I think from our presentation is, I hope it's evident. <laughs> I hope we've tried to communicate it that this undertaking is not only machine learning engineers or data scientists or such. It is not technostic. It's, we have to rely on a lot of expertise. We have to question about the way we're modeling human language and the applications in which we serve these models. How does this affect human, how does this affect human uh, interaction? In what communities are we deploying this? How, how, how are we helping the communities? And so that's from one side, maybe, and from a sociological, and that's from a sociological perspective. And from a linguistical perspective is we have to think about questions such as how accurately are we modeling the morphology of Kinyarwanda or other languages or other morphology rich languages in Africa or in other low resource settings. So I hope this will be, I hope that it's clear that this is a call to action. That if you're there and you're thinking, I want to help my community by creating voice technologies and supporting people, that you have a place. You have a very critical role in the team of how to develop these applications. And coming to a close, if you do have notes or you just want to shoot some ideas on how to improve Kenya Rwanda. And maybe it, it does not have to limit to Kenya Rwanda because if we work together and we understand how to develop other languages, most likely we can learn from this roadmap. We can, we can learn from this pipeline and, apl and apply to other low resource languages. And so please do email me or Kelly and let's chat. Thank you very much. I think I think Samuel had a question. Yes, I do. Um, I don't know. Can I go ahead? Uh, yes, please. All right. Fantastic presentation. I it's really uh, interesting. Okay, so um, your last slide really really caught my attention, and uh, I don't want to pull it too far so that um, Chris will not say, "Okay, Samuel has started again," <laughs> and I'm trying to drag. <laughs> trying to drag okay but then uh you are asking the question i have basically i've been asking for a longer for a long time now okay so if you build a model how representative is it to human speech language and then 
if you build a model, either textual or speech, now how is he modeling human understanding? And then by sociology now, you say, okay, what is the sociological value of the model you are building? Okay, uh, over time I have tried to climb out that most uh, models, if it is a speech model, it is coming from the Bible. If it is uh, a textual model, it is mostly coming from the news. So we are having just a domain of the human brain, a representation of language, rather than representing other domains. When I say domain, I'm not talking about whether it is medical or um, uh, whether it is society. I'm saying that we are using data sets, mostly building on um, uh, speech that are coming from just Bible texts. If it is textualized, built, it is coming basically from news. So what that is doing is that it is training a model that is representing a language variety. So now coming to the sociology now, we're talking about the variation of languages. I'm talking about the, the, the king terms and other geographical uh, representation of languages. Okay, as I'm talking now, I can't, I can't speak the way I would speak in a colloquial speech that I'm speaking now, right? And if I'm casting a news or I'm writing a news, there, there are terms I'm not, I'm not permitted to use because I am just within the news domain. Okay, so if we say how accurate is our modeling of human language, to me, I would say just 15%. So if we keep uh, you, modeling... You, you, would, you would say 15%? Yeah, I would say 15%. And where, is I added, number, where is this number coming from? <laughs> I, I, okay, why I said 50% is from my own perspective. And I'm saying that because... If you would agree with me, we barely collect data sets. And it's not about the AI community alone, even the linguistics community. When we are dealing with, when you're writing linguistic papers, especially if you're a native speaker, we barely go to the field to see how the language is working. And that is why we have a different field, with, even within linguistics, called field work. And in field work, you are meant to go to where the language is spoken and document the language in its natural setting. That way, you get to see the language in its raw area. And when you train a model in this area, you are meant, you are liable to train a smarter model because you tend to use, you tend to see words you wouldn't see in a normal, in a normal data set. You tend to see words you wouldn't see in the, in the formal way because we tend to edit a lot of things. I'm talking, when I'm speaking, I'm, I'm doing contraction, I'm formulating something, I'm doing some that you won't see in a formal textual writing. Okay, yeah, so you, you, now, you're doing code switching, you're, you know, exactly. you're putting, uh, now, so, now, yeah. now, going to the sociology now, uh, uh, there is a man, Delheims, I don't know whether you're aware of Delheims. Delheims theory is saying that well, we can't have a competence of a language by just learning the rules or the algorithm of the language. And language is not an algorithm. Language is different. Okay, so, and he's saying that we deal with language in a social setting. Okay, I can't tell you, are you mad in this setting? It is a sentence in English, right? But I won't say, are you mad here? Yeah. Why? Because in a, in a social competence, it's not enough for you to know the, how to speak the language or how to know the rules of the language. It is enough for you to know when to use the language. So you see AI community, they are looking for a way to teach a model to say, okay, you want to say, how are you? You should know how to say, how are you? Okay, in my, in my own dialect of Yoruba, there is a way we say, good morning. And we mark it with gender. Okay, so if you train a model that is not using politeness and it doesn't know when to use politeness, you are training a model how to speak my dialect, but it does not even know the social competence of the language. So you can just meet anybody and say, how are you? And a native speaker will tell you that, no, we don't say like, we don't say like this. Okay, so this thing is saying that the sociology of the language is just away from what we are doing. It's Elon Musk keep shouting that, is afraid of AI communities, afraid of AI communities because we are building a common sense away from how human think. Now going to the cognitive aspects now, I have a, a, a supervisor, she finished from Cornell University and she's doing something in AI and what she does is she, she tests, she's modeling human speech and human language using cognitive infrastructure. It's so crazy. She uses fMRI, uh, I don't know, it's a complex way, but when I uh, when I had a conversation uh, with her, yes, yes. 
I have, oh, sorry, when I, when I, I don't think I'm familiar with this acronym. For, for, for image, oh. Uh, oh, uh, uh, MRI. MRI. What MRI. is FMRI? Oh, okay. F okay. Yeah, okay. She, she uses MRI. She uses FMRI. FMRI, I don't know. Basically, you know, we, oh, I don't want to go. We, in acoustic phonetics. Oh, okay. We deal, we deal with uh, fundamental frequency. So if I want to get Kiruanda, there is a way I could, I could plot acoustic phonetics, the fundamental frequency of R, for example, model it over different speakers of different community, I mean, different age group. Then I can get an average score, then put it in a computer and try to model that's FM. The F there is fundamental. But I don't want to go into those uh, talks. Where I'm going is that going back to your questions, I would love to I would love to shed more light and to ask a question now that okay, how do you intend to now in Rwanda? I love the linguistic teacher of Rwanda because it's kind of a which I don't agree to me anyway. I've not been there, but I don't agree. From the linguistic point of view, uh, geographical locations contribute to dialectal differences. For example, if you are speaking a language and you have uh, a mountain, if you are speaking Kiruanda from the left and right of the mountain, we are bound to speak different dialects, even though we are speaking Kiruanda. Okay, it is not possible to have uh, the same dialect qualities in a spatial domain. It has never been possible in linguistic analysis. We might be wrong, but it is never possible. If you are in a state or a region of the language, the region, the spatial differences, uh, what, what people call ethno-linguistic analysis will make the dialect different, such as you can be in a region where you have more well or more river. You are tend to have more names for rivers than in a region where you have more stones than rivers. So that way, even your lexical apparatus will be different. Okay, so how do you now tend to unify the fact that these geographical and spatial uh, properties could differentiate the Kiruanda community rather than its language itself? So, and that is where I talk about the social competence. So it's not enough for you to say that Kiruanda is a single language, but it's enough for you to now know that, okay, in a societal setting, in a society, how applicable is what I'm doing? And it go back to what to that is not enough for you to speak a language, but you must be able to know when, which is the society to use the language. So how do you mean to trace these biases I've mentioned, and how do you intend to cater for it? I don't want to take uh, much of the time. Thank you. Ah, I, I feel I feel uh, this question would be answered in something of a five ten page paper or something it's quite a loaded question <laughs> to be honest but uh but i will i will answer on to some points that i have some knowledge about and some recommendations about how can we change this so for example you're talking about modeling human language and how is it applied in an actual natural manner in life right and so we at the end of it all at the end of it all when we think about creating learning representations, which are models, models are just learning representations of something. In language, it's, in NLP, it just happens to be language. And if you're doing quant quantum trading or whatever, uh, quantitative trading or whatever, it, it's a learning representation of the stock or whatever, as such. So at the end of it all, we need to have examples of how to teach the machine to understand it. And so the, 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 the benchmarks we have currently are mainly for high resource, for resource rich languages, right? For English and such. But looking at our languages, looking at, sorry, looking at low resource languages globally, is that we have different grammatical rules at the word level, at the sentence level, at the semantic level, as how you've said, is that if I speak one, the greeting and uh, sorry, I, I don't know if you mentioned Hausa, but even this small, simple thing as greeting is different depending on who you are addressing. In, in so, Hausa, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and so I, I, know I, 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 I know I was. I know I was speaking Hausa. I also find it. I also find it uh, very exciting that apparently Hausa is spoken by maybe more than sixty million people, right? Exactly. 
Exactly. So you know, so th th this is this is this is a, this is something we can work on that we can we can learn from a lot of the uh, human uh, interaction or such, and it could be applied on a massive scale level. And so you're asking about how are we annotating this data? How are we recording it? And so, for example, let me give you an example. Look at the the Mozilla Common Voice uh, data set. Right. This is people reading transcripts, but this is not how humans speak. Correct. So in a, in a, in a new undertaking, maybe we can think about how can we collect data in a more natural format? Not giving you a paper. Hey, read this and uh, record yourself for 2000 hours. I, I have ideas about that. Ex ex precisely. So how can we engage people to just how, how can we collect data that is representative of a natural format? That we're, we're, not, we're not creating silos or uh, uh, sandboxes of, 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 uh, of data collection of uh, sit here and read this. That is not how we speak. We speak in a natural manner. Look at, look at our interaction over here, right? I, 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 wish, I wish I was having this one in uh, Kinyaranda for data collection. <laughs> so, so that is one way to go about, right? Let's look at what has been done. And how can we collect data in a different sense? And so on the same level, you talk about these models do not work for everything. They do not work for all languages. And that is correct. Because for, mo for most times, the pre-trained embeddings, the pre-trained models of such are taught in embeddings for English or such. And so when you bring a morphologically rich language such as Kinyaranda, is this, this fails. This fails. Things such as uh, subword tokenization or such does not work because our language has, has agglutinations. It has concatenations of word, which would not make sense, but this is how it works. So we have to think about what is the source material? What is the source data of how these models that we teach, the birth models, uh, or such, how are they being trained in low resource languages? And uh, so I, I, I hope I answered your question to some extent, but I feel like coming to a close is all about, we have to just work on the wheel. We have to look at the data that we're using, make sure it has appropriate representations and retrain at the end of the day, retrain, Retrain, retrain. Okay, um, thank you very much. Maybe let's see if other people have other questions. I'm, I'm sure someone has many more questions, but let's see if others have. Um, I think we had a question around how uh, they can join the community. I think I like if you can reload the PPT I've added the slide uh, with the Slack channel, WhatsApp channel. Um, Okay, okay. And we'll also add it to the, the video description. I think we have a question from Shaku. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, hi. Hey, colleagues, and thank you so much for uh, that powerful presentation. Uh, man, it's, it's not a question, but uh, just a comment. I want to actually appreciate the work that you, you guys are doing. Because in the process of... Uh, digitizing our, our languages. In a way, you're creating a space for our languages online. And in that way, our, our languages uh, will not uh, die. As much as you digitize the language, people, people will be able to, to learn the language. And when, when coming to the part of uh, creating the speed side of, of our languages, you, you're also contributing immensely to uh, our languages because someone can just learn a language by looking or listening uh, to how uh, words are spoken in particular language. Let's say maybe it's uh, Aruba, Yoruba, it is uh, Kinyaranda. I can just yes. learn language through listening it online. So thank you so much for, for your contribution. Uh, ab ab absolutely, absolutely. We're... <laughs> We're, we're, we're trying, we're, but but we hope we hope we can engage as many efforts as we can, you know. Uh, 
having opportunities such as this presented by Land Africa Talks, you know, I'm getting questions and the critique from people like Samuel who are motivated about this is if we can all coalesce our efforts and understand and learn from each other. And so I think I think this, I think then we can know what to do next. I, I hope uh, that makes sense to some extent, but is that the roadmap or exactly the roadmap, the project charter is still, is, is quite uh, dynamic. Is every other day you have something new you're learning. Oh, I could do this that way. Oh, I could do that the other way, you know? Uh, just just last month, we just finished this, uh, we just finished this uh, hackathon on on uh, text augmentation. And and so a few weeks ago, I was in this presentation by uh, Vukosi, uh, I think who's also a researcher in uh, uh, in the Masakani, he's from South Africa. And it was it was it was so confirming to see that he had a few points about how can we in a space that is that is scarce in our low resource communities and such. How do we create more? How do we create more data? And so that's that's always the point. So every other day we learn something. <laughs> I, I hope uh, so. I hope we can have an exchange and and and, and learn from each other. Thank you so much, Isaac Manzi and Kilia Mugenzi for this insightful talk about the work you are doing in building language technologies for Kenya Rwanda language. It's very inspiring to see the impact of your work to the community. So you have the ambassador chat board, you have the ASL TTS, you have the competitions. It's really good to see that the, um, the technologies or the efforts you're making are actually directly impacting the Rwandan community in this case, or the other projects of Fair Forward in Uganda and Kenya. It's very inspiring to see that this work, it's very, very, um, it reaches the community. So it's not just a research paper that gets published and stays on archive or somewhere. It's actually something that the community members, you have some numbers about people use daily usage and statistics. So that's very very, very um, insightful, very, very inspiring, very, very um, laudable. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here for this wonderful talk. And thank you to our, um, those who will be watching this video and see you all next two weeks for another amazing talk. Thank you so much once again, Isaac Manzi and Kelly McGinty. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much, Samuel, and everyone else who posed questions. We love having the platform to chat with other enthusiasts and other interested uh, individuals around the globe.